So, hi everybody. Hi everybody. So, uh, I'm Joël Facou and I'm, uh, I'm Vincent Roverdi. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, thanks for coming to our talk about uh, taking templates further. Um, where we speak about pack types and uh, non type template parameters and what kind of things we we can do with that. Uh, just a quick introduction. So um, I'm uh, I'm Joel. I'm an assistant professor uh, in uh, Paris Saclay, and I'm also a C plus plus trainer. And uh, Vincent probably worked for all the other guys on on the slide uh, <laughs> exactly. all at once or something. <laughs> Um, we will start about giving some context about what we want to achieve in this talk, and uh, we will go over a series of um, several uh, parts with different topics. And uh, I would encourage you to um, ask your questions either through the, the chat or the, um, the Q and A panel, and um, we will answer questions after each topic, so we can actually get the, the answer when, whenever the, uh, the topic is still fresh into everybody's mind. So um, what are we going to talk about? Um, both Vincent and I are working into um, somehow uh, a field related to high performance computing or at least scientific computing. And the one thing you need when apparently you do science is uh, putting numbers into arrays with various number of dimensions. And uh, you want to um, shake these numbers quite fast until something happens and you get a result. Uh, and if the result is good enough, you call that science. Uh, <laughs> jokes aside, um, it sounds like an easy uh, task, uh, designing uh, an array types for handling um, complex computation and whatnot. But actually, uh, when you talk to... Uh, the actual users of such library, uh, mainly physicists and other scientists, um, well, they are there for doing science. And the, the less computer science they can do, the, the, the better, actually. Like I would this. say, yeah. yeah it, should be <laughs> it should work out it of the box. It should work, you know. And so uh, this n-dimensional array, because physicists are that, you know, uh, fancy that two dimension is not enough. Uh, they want it to be fast, because the faster you compute, the faster you, you get results. And uh, as I said, in a more serious uh, position, uh, we want this kind of tool to be easy to use for, um, let's say, a domain experts more than computer science experts. And uh, people want to be able to express whatever, whatever they may need uh, to express to, to solve their issue. So we should not, um, we should not restrict the expressivity of the, of the tool. So how can you actually go uh, doing this? So. <clears throat> When people want to speak about uh, going fast, it probably means that there is some kind of uh, hardware support that need to be uh, provided. And the abstraction you give on top of your uh, systems uh, should be uh, as, uh, as, I mean, um, small and uh, non-intrusive as possible. So you should not hinder performances. Uh, you should also be able to uh, make your users not able to write bad code, especially in terms of performance, you should uh, make your API such as uh, performance and pattern are not something that you can write easily. Uh, this means that we need to tap into the domain expertise to, uh, to wrap all these things. And uh, usually when people deal with this kind of systems, you, you can probably uh, split them into two kinds. Uh, the ones that are just wanting to use this for getting some kind of fast results. And uh, some kind of, let's say, power users that want to be able to very precisely uh, configure or or use a very special system. So your, your code should be able to, I mean, um, be usable by those two kinds of, um, of users. And we are doing uh, numeric things, so the numeric code should look numeric. So the amount of uh, syntactic clutter should be minimal. Everything should behave like, like you think it should behave. Uh, there is a lot of existing solutions for that, either, uh, I mean, based on simple view and containers, either in the standard or stuff like Boost QVM and the most recent uh, STDM DSPAN proposal, for example. And you have a huge amount of 
a third party library based on a system about using uh, you know uh, expression templates to do uh, both providing a container system and an evaluation system and so on and so forth um to have worked on this kind of system for a while we finally find out that there was something that people were doing wrong oh i forgot to be I forgot tested the array, which is also something which she should have been uh, the way to uh, handle uh, value arrays in C++ to do a uh, numeric uh, computation with that, but you don't talk about that. Uh, it's probably one of the most uh, non-controversial uh, failure of the standard library, so let's forget that array. We with won't speak with about vector that. bool, probably. Yeah, and vector <laughs> bool. Don't, don't speak about vector bool either. Now, more, more seriously, um, if you want to have all these things uh, working together, it's complicated. And um, our stance on the issue for quite a while now is that the, the problem of performance or expressivity or uh, interaction with the new standards um, come from the fact that all those tools try to do everything at once. Uh, they want to provide lazy evaluation. They want to provide the ND-like array container things. Uh, the customization protocols and how to support the hardware. And uh, one of our stance is that this, these things are four uh, separate concerns that should uh, be uh, solved separately. So um, if you may know about, we already give a bunch of talk about some of these subjects, how to do proper lazy evaluation and how to manage our support in a generic way. And today we we'll just be uh, trying to uh, fit into this um, pattern of thoughts by trying to see how uh, we can maximize the reusability of those components and avoid this monolith effect by focusing on the ND array things. So we won't be speaking about all those things at once, but the question is, I want to have n-dimensional containers. I want it to be easy to use and rather close to uh, the performance of what I should have if I wrote something by hand, how should I do that? And to do so, we will be dissecting our ongoing project of this ND array uh, library thing, which is called Kiwaku, um, and trying to see how we try to solve different aspects of this problem and how we think it actually solves this in a, in a better way than uh, the other solutions. So there's a question about all of this, and this will be the, uh, the, the, the continuum theme, is that designing an API for a bunch of users is actually hard. And uh, what we want to be able to do is exploiting the maximum amount of information the user put into the code. And this information can be uh, retrieved in two ways. Either I can know about it at compile time, and I need to exploit it at this point, or uh, I will be able to uh, find a way to retrieve this information at runtime. But the most thing I do at compile time, the better. Which means that the users themselves should be able to pass this high-level information as, uh, as an information to the compiler. We should prevent uh, implementation leaks or abstraction leaks, the fact that you force your user to write the code or use constructing your code in a way that blatantly show how the thing is implemented. This makes the API rather rigid. Uh, you cannot just change it whenever you need because people probably, like, like they always do, wrote code that take advantage of the uh, implementation details they guessed from the API you get. It makes the evolution of the API very complicated because you cannot just say, OK, I can swap these parameters, or I can add another one because probably someone is depending on this order. And uh, it's also something that you can find uh, found uh, in the fact that some concern should actually be um, solved at compile time, it's also at runtime, or the other way around. And uh, if you take examples of what actually exists without uh, taking shot at anybody, um, the fact that you have to use a special value in MD span or span, even if it's hidden and uh, under um, under um, a constant value is such a thing. Uh, you can see that also in the fact that if you are relying on passing a lot of information as uh, separate um, template parameters, um, if you want to make uh, a prototype of your type uh, into something else, uh, you're pretty much stuck because you cannot just 
we order them or whatever. So this kind of uh, encode, directly encoding the information directly into the types uh, is actually something that limits what you can do. And another example is the fact that, for example, we need currently to pass the allocated types uh, to, for example, a container type, uh, which makes the, uh, the design and the use of function taking such containers uh, unnecessarily template. So that, that's a bunch of examples. There is a lot of more, and uh, we wanted to avoid that. And uh, to avoid that, what we wanted to do was to actually um, design the API, um, let's say, what we call the correct way. Start by writing what you want your user to write, and uh, derive the implementation from that, and do whatever you can to make it to make it work. The cool thing is that C plus plus twenty and C plus plus seventeen a bit. Uh, now give us a lot of tools so we can actually uh, go from this hypothetical uh, API to a proper implementation. Uh, we will be speaking about three things. Um, we will be talking about how we handle runtime components like allocator uh, by using opaque types to uh, not having to deal with uh, allocated types into the, um, the container um, types. Um, how we can specify optimization or options uh, by using keyword parameters and how we can actually make them work in C++ without too much uh, hassle. And uh, we'll speak about again about the uh, compile time and runtime buyer uh, by seeing how we can actually manage to uh, have a seamless interaction between uh, options at compile time and at runtime and having, uh, how to say that, an homogeneous way to, to specify this using uh, NTTPs uh, in generic context. So that's what the, the, the things we will be going around. And uh, so we, we, have, we have a small question right now about, yeah, is lazy evaluation the same as expression template? Yes, that's basically exactly what we, uh, we, um, uh, we um, mean by that. We mean by that, yeah. Lazy evaluation is the fact that you build a representation of your computation and later on, uh, we will do the evaluation. So expression template is actually one way to, to do that, basically. Okay. So let's let's continue and let's jump into the first uh, pieces of uh, information about opaque types. Um, so basically what we want to be able to write is something like this. So we have this array uh, types uh, that is defined by uh, the type of the element it contains very uh, classically, uh, and a tag that will indicate how many uh, dimensions it actually have. Okay, and uh, sometimes you want to use a special allocator uh, to do something. And uh, one uh, usual uh, issue with uh, passing allocator as a type that people uh, complain about is the fact that it makes your 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 type a bit more complex. And uh, if you think about it, uh, most of the time allocators are a very simple beast. Uh, they are probably easy to copy anyway, or trivial to copy. And uh, they only take care about uh, runtime information. So what if we can actually just pass an allocator as, uh, as, as a parameter of the constructors and not have to uh, deal with it into the, the typing? And whenever we assign or copy uh, one array to another, everything is uh, actually done right. So how can we get rid of that, of the, of the allocator type as a parameter? And how can we ensure everything copy or move properly? So one, way we one thing we wanted to um, explore for that was use opaque types. Um, so if I give a definition, uh, a C definition, a type is opaque if you cannot see through it. Okay. Uh, Yep, sense. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> now, more see, you see, it means that uh, the content of implementation is not something you can access directly. And uh, one way to do this uh, in C++ is to use type eraser to actually, um, you know, smudge uh, the implementation details of a large variety of uh, different types uh, behind uh, behind uh, a given actual. Uh, runtime-based uh, types. Uh, so the less people can actually have a look at what's going on inside your types, the less they will be tempted to uh, actually, you know, like use some kind of uh, side channel information, like like how many members they have or whatever the ordering of the things. 
Um, we decided to go with um, what we consider state of the art for, for this thing, which is uh, reusing the um, the notion of uh, polymorphism as presented by Sean Parent in you know, one of his multiple talks on the subject, where basically we will be using runtime polymorphism to do type eraser, but instead, instead of having these things as a first prop, first class property of the type, it's just an implementation details. And uh, this thing will help us um, to engage with the user and, and provide more options for a given type without having to resort to forcing people to use uh, Techniques like uh, CRTP or an actual inheritance from a past class. Uh, so the idea is that we you will be hiding the polymorphism inside your type, and your your opaque type will just be a regular type, something that can be copied or moved, whatever. Uh, that will internally uh, use polymorphism for uh, um, managing his behavior. And the uh, cool thing with that is that it's completely transparent from the user from the user perspective. So <clears throat> if we go down into details, what, what kind of opaque type can you can you spot in the Y? Um, five, the five pointer in C is basically probably the oldest one. It's just something you know it's there is a fine information somewhere inside that you cannot you, you cannot access this. Um STD &E and STD function, among other elements of the standard, are also very uh, classical uh, example of opaque types. And uh, if you want to dig into a very uh, very generic way to generate opaque types and uh, things like that, you can have a look at uh, Louis Dion's uh, Dino um, library, which basically takes that to another level. But it's basically the same um, same idea of hiding these things uh, in a generic way. So um, yeah, opaque types, allocators. Um, how can we actually? Uh, managed to do this. So we have a very uh, specific use case. We are dealing with dynamic arrays, uh, which are rather large, okay, uh, and uh, full of numeric value. Uh, the allocation are often uh, out of the critical class, most of them, and we have few resizing and arbitrary growth. We don't push back values into a four-dimension array or something like that. Uh, we have some copies but not much resizing. Um, and we wanted to be able to uh, support more than just malloc free or new new uh, new delete based um, allocators. So we wanted to be able to uh, have a way to specify new allocators. Um, so the setup is the following one. We decided to use the uh, Alexander Alexander school uh, model of allocator, which means that our allocator just allocates block of memory, which just store into uh, an object uh, through uh, a void pointer and, and the length. So every memory block know about the length it's supposed to represent, uh, which allow us to sometimes uh, optimize some allocators. And uh, allocators themselves can be chained or configured by different policies uh, in an arbitrary way. Um, have a look at all the allocator-based uh, talk about uh, by uh, Alexander. It's very interesting. So we have this block-based allocator system. We will give an example right after that. On top of that, what we do is um, we will be pushing a way that people can actually write an allocator just by writing a function, uh, sorry, uh, a structure that just match the, the concept of allocator we need. No CRTP, no uh, public inheritance, no bass class. And uh, once we do that, we put that into a box that turns everything into a semi-regular type that we just carry along uh, the, the array, and that follows them uh, during the, its lifetime. And we won't deal about knowing, you know, should I copy this uh, allocator or so should I not? We, we just copy everything uh, because most of the time it's trivial anyway, and uh, we don't know actually what's behind this polymorphic world. So let's have a look at the implementation. So the basic block of memory is rather trivial. Uh, you have a structure. Uh, it contains a pointer to void, a size, and you have a bunch of operations that let you uh, resist, swap, compare those blocks of memory. Uh, from there, what we will be doing is that whenever we write an allocator, it allocates a block, and it gets allocated a block. 
So you can actually write a trivial malloc based allocator, which is basically two functions in a box. Uh, so you request some amount of bytes, and you return a block that, that contains allocated memory of this size uh, and the size you requested for, or not. If it's empty, you just return a new pointer. And this allocate checks the value of the data, and if it's non null, it would just pass it to free. It's just that, just two functions in a structure. You can easily write a more complex allocator using this model. And uh, if needed, they can be swappable, if this makes sense. But it's uh, it's most of the time trivial to do so. Um, so we can write allocator like that rather trivial. But now uh, we want to show that into this opaque type. So the opaque type will be based on a multi uh, multiple elements. The first element is the actual virtual API object that will look like an allocator and provide virtual function uh, to store polymorphically the information of the type. Uh, we will have a template adapter that will um, take an actual, an actual um, allocator types and uh, make it so it, it fits into this virtual API and the actual wrapper uh, that will be any allocator. It's not the same thing that what you can do with a PMR uh, allocator. It's, it's a bit different. Okay, and uh, we also have a concept that match what an allocator is. This concept is rather trivial. We just change that it's a semi-regular types. It's swappable, and if you give me a block or a size, I can allocate something with the size, and it's a block. And uh, if you give me a block, I can disallocate it. So that's that's something rather trivial at this point. Uh, from there, uh, we would define this virtual API, classic uh, polymorphic types. Uh, with allocate and deallocate virtual functions that will just be used to forward to the actual types. And uh, we have this clone function uh, that will let us uh, polymorphically copy and or clone uh, an allocator directly from the um, from the uh, pointer to the to the bus class. So we then have this template adapter that takes something that models the concept allocator. It generates from the API types, and what it does, it's constructible from whatever T, which is an allocator. It's copied or moved into its internal representation, and uh, it itself provides an allocate and disallocate uh, override from the API T types that just for while the allocator, the deallocate, uh, calls to the internal object and clone, just clone the object by calling make unique uh, by copying the object inside it. So both of those types will be uh, hidden inside the wrapper types, which is any allocator. And what any, any allocator does, just host um, a unique PTR to this uh, virtual uh, polymorphic API type. It's constructible from whatever you want uh, itself, another types that match uh, the allocator concept. And uh, whenever we do a copy or a move, we just fill the unique PTR with a proper uh, value out of the, of the type you, you, you give it. And it provides non-virtual function allocated and disallocated just forward to uh, the um, actual disallocation and allocation uh, interface of the virtual object, which in terms will be filled with one, uh, one instantiation of the model class uh, which will be instantiated with the actual type T itself. And so when we, we put everything together, uh, we have this any allocator uh, system that just eats up whatever looks like an allocator thanks to the concept. And from there, you can actually just store an any allocator in our array. Uh, so it will cost us uh, the size of a unique PTR. That's the cost of these things. Uh, but it will basically simplify all the other elements. Uh, we won't have to deal with uh, anything special with regard to uh, transferring or copying the allocator, and uh, the behavior of the of the array just just works. But what if we we look at the timing? Because I'm doing um, I'm doing uh, allocation. I have a a bunch of um, memory to allocate. I have this um, virtual API to cross. What's the cost? 
So we did a bunch of bench in different situations. So in these cases, we allocate, disallocate a block of 16 megabytes uh, in a scenario which is very favorable to devirtualization because the compiler just sees that we put some allocator into the AE allocator. And in this case, we basically have the same time anyway. So um, the, the system does not uh, put obstacles, doesn't hinder the uh, devirtualization process. And uh, we are within two or three uh, percent one or the other. So which is something for us which is completely uh, manageable. Now, if we do another bench in which we basically uh, burst allocate a multiple block of 60 megabytes and we store them somewhere and we just clean them up at the end so we don't, we cannot reuse the same memory at each step. And we force the functions that allocate uh, using any allocator um, to never be in a, in a position where you can actually virtualize. So we, we use no inline and other tricks so that the compiler cannot do anything but uh, actually calling the uh, virtual API. Uh, well, if you take uh, into account the, uh, the standard deviation error, uh, we're pretty much into the same, uh, same bracket also at plus minus, uh, let's say, 4 5%, up to 8%. So... It's not perfect, but it's okay. But what if now we, we allocate a very, very small amount of memory, which should be uh, less demanding for the system and so don't dominate uh, the virtual function code. So let's allocate 256 bytes and uh, we go back to this five and five something percent uh, issue, even into the uh, non devitalization uh, system. So the, the performance themselves are okay. It's not perfect. And again, I will emphasize that it's something we are willing to pay in the use case we have. Uh, it's not a generic multidimensional object. We have these very um, specific uh, use cases that we need to um, take into account. But one thing in another, it's actually okay because by not having to uh, carries this information to the type, the, the actual template API of the type is uh, easier to manage. Uh, we won't be able to, uh, to ask people to just use virtual function whenever they want to be sure they, uh, they deal with multiple array with different allocator. It's just not there. So the template API is less rigid. It's easier to, um, um, to um, make uh, evolve later. And uh, the cool thing is that we can actually take all of these allocator things and probably pre-compile it in the library. Uh, and uh, yeah, we we tried to see if uh, link time optimization could kick in, and sometimes it does. So uh, it's something that you can shove into a binary and forget about it. Um, we were also quite surprised by the fact that we can actually get something meaningful using uh, Shen Parent's polymorphic types idea. Uh, it's something that is actually easy to maintain and uh, rather trivial to explain to users whenever they want to uh, play the power user actually and, and make new um, a new allocator or whatever. Um, but yeah, we, we need benchmarking. Uh, so that's not that's not probably trivial in any cases, but uh, for for our case, it was actually uh, actually quite uh, quite interesting to sorry be able to uh, to get there. So we have a bunch of questions. Um, so why not just use STDPMR uh, for type errors uh, allocation? Um, multiple reasons. Uh, I will be completely honest with you when we started that, I have no actual uh, clue about uh, PMR and uh, it was something that um, I saw at very specific to, um, to what the standard was doing. And after digging into it later, um, the, the way uh, polymorphic resources works was not exactly what we wanted to get. Uh, we should be able to do something with them. Uh, but currently, we just decided to go with these things. Uh, the other, uh, the other reason was that we we wanted to get this um, Alexander Sue style allocator, and we wanted to be able to uh, manage the uh, interface of our allocator to what we were actually requiring for our use cases. And it was simplest for us to uh, 
start from scratch and, and build up this way. Uh, we can actually probably make some adapters from for standard allocator and standard PM allocator yeah. to fit. So we, we can actually test that at some point. But when we started, it was not something we had on uh, on the radar. If it's if it's answer your question, Andre. Uh, slide twenty nine. Uh, yeah, benchmark scenario with different allocator types to measure misprediction. That's also something uh, we should be doing. Those benchmarks are rather uh, blunt in the in the sense that we wanted to check that uh, we don't end up uh, with completely unusable uh, systems like I don't know, like we spend like uh, thirty or forty percent of our time uh, trying to to find what what's going on. Um, the multiple allocator type scenario could be actually interesting. Uh, but probably not something that happens quite a lot in our use cases, but that's an interesting point. Uh, I think we will be, should be testing that mm. at some point. That, that's a good, uh, a, good um, a good suggestion. Thank you. So uh, we get rid of this uh, pesky allocator uh, type information from the, uh, from, the, from the template parameters. The other thing we wanted to be able to do is to find a way to shield ourselves against, um, sorry, against uh, another problem with um, defining API, uh, especially in, in the case where we have a very set, a very complex set of possible options. Uh, we wanted to be able to write that at some point. Again, we we, we do this. We start for what we, whatever we want to write and, and try to fit something inside. So we wanted to be able to write this. Uh, we wanted to say, okay, I, I can have a default allocator or whatever, and uh, got some shape, okay. Uh, but sometimes maybe I want to shape in a different allocator, or I want to shape in some uh, specific stride, or I don't know later, uh, I want to have some allocator and some, uh, um, I'll say that, some um, MPI distribution layout or whatever new piece of API. And uh, we wanted to be able to pass all those information in a way that makes sense, it's trivial to uh, guess and uh, to uh, manipulate. And that doesn't uh, prevent us to actually add new things later on. And uh, one thing we found cool from other languages and other library in other languages that did with Array was the, uh, the use of keyword-like parameters. And we were like, okay, can we actually write something like this when so we have some kind of Keyword parameters, show it some value, pass all those bunch of keyword parameters and values to the um, to the constructors, and and the constructor will probably find its way somehow, and uh, and done. Uh, keyword parameters in C plus uh, plus is probably uh, yeah. Um, how to say that? <laughs> uh, not something people agree about. So let's let's say that. Uh, no problem. Yeah, there is a lot of problem. Uh, you can have a look at the uh, 4172 papers if you want to have a check about the kind of discussion that went around that. Uh, there is a lot of common cases if you want to have a, a language-based solution for uh, keyword parameters. Uh, what should they do? Or do you, which name of the parameters count? Is it the one from the uh, header? Is it the one from the implementation? Uh, what about mangling? Uh, and so on and so forth. So what we wanted to do was to say, okay, can we just design something that just do what we need, okay, and and see what we can do. Uh, so we want to pass parameters as keyword to the uh, constructor of the array and view, so we can actually uh, simplify the API or actually make it so we can actually define new uh, elements for the constructor later. Um, we wanted also to be able to pass context where parameters to array and view. And we see that in detail in the last part. Uh, we were okay with having uh, predefined keywords, but uh, if we can actually uh, des um, describe them and define them on the fly, it's it's cool. And uh, we wanted to have a way to say, okay, I'm just taking a bunch of keywords parameters, and I want to be able to restrict them first by being sure you are giving me keyword parameters and not a bunch of arbitrary types. And uh, I want to be sure that the subset of um, keywords I'm dealing with is the one I want. Um, we started doing this inside Kiwaku, and then we, we find out that it was something uh, that can live on its own. So we have a small library for doing this. It 
for Raberu. And lastly, what we do, we have a way to design uh, unique types that we uh, instantiate as an inline context for objects that serves as a, a seed for the keywords. Uh, and the, the data that we feed into the uh, into the keyword parameters is shoved into a lambda. We will show that. And uh, we have a bunch of concepts and requires clauses that we can reuse to be sure that uh, we can actually uh, control what's going on. So we have a keyword object that acts as a keyword builder. Uh, you can actually build a keyword by actually building uh, an object yourself from these uh, keyword things, uh, either by passing in a local uh, a local types this way, like we do on line four, uh, that works. Or uh, we have we have a UDL thing that we can use to say, okay, this is the this is uh, the the name of the of the keywords, and uh, either you can reuse it directly, like we did to the other example, or we can actually show it into a, a pre existing uh, context for inline variables. Uh, and we use this infamous non standard GNU extension on UDL to uh, to parse the characters or the string into a series of car. Uh, not the, the best way to do that right now, uh, but it works. Uh, and so basically, line seven generate a code, which is basically what happened on, on line 10. Uh, we are currently looking at turning that into something where you can actually use a context per string like on a static object. But it's not a big deal, uh, implementation details. Uh, what you want is have a unique, uniquely tagged uh, keyword from that. And from there, uh, those things. Those keyword things as uh, generic assignment operators that really touch whatever uh, value you put in them. And it returns something that we call a linked value, which is uh, an object contained based on the lambda functions. Uh, the lambda is responsible of capturing the parameters, and uh, it accepts the keyword itself as a function parameters. And those lambda will then be aggregated into something that look a lot like um, uh, the uh, overload like structures that you can use when you when you deal with std visitor and uh, every function call operator of every lambda of this bag bag of lambdas is put back into the interface and uh, we basically fetch the value of a keyword by passing the keyword back to this and uh, we let the uh, function uh, overloads on the uh, function call operators do its magic and uh, what we also do is we have we add sorry um, some kind of um, a dead end overload for this function collaborator. So we how uh, uh, to say that we um, one two three we can detect that the, you were using a, comp uh, a keyword parameter that you uh, doesn't make doesn't make sense. If we take a look at that, so keyword types operator equal is basically this. Uh, if the, uh, the parameter is an actual reference, we store it by reference. And uh, if not, we just move the R-value reference inside the lambda. And the lambda, as I say, takes the, uh, the type itself or the keyword parameters as, a, as, a, as parameters and returns the, um, the value inside as a, as a reference. And so these linked values are then aggregated uh, into this aggregate of things uh, that inherit from every other lambda that you pass it. And we have these uh, unknown key things uh, that, that we can use to detect the fact that basically you passed us um, a keyword that doesn't exist in, in this subset. And so what we do is that we use an helper uh, object called settings that we can actually uh, wrap every parameter inside and use it as a, as a way to extract a value from, from this. Detect if the keyword is actually defined in this blob of values, validate the list of keywords, and so on and so forth. And we can actually specify default value if you don't find uh, the actual keywords. And we have a keyword parameters concept that match on the, the pair keyword equal value. And we have a match function that we can use to say, okay, does my bunch of keywords parameters uh, actually contains what I want to. Uh, I want them to, to contain. 
So basically, you can write code like this. Uh, you take two parameters, you don't know what they are, you shove it into a settings, and you can use the bracket operator to fetch uh, the uh, parameters you want to get. So you can call replicate with a replication count, which is equal to nine, and a letter which is equal to Z, and we do this very complicated task of returning uh, a string with nine Z inside. Um, but you can also, and which is actually for us a bit better, you can also take an, an arbitrary amount of uh, params, okay, shove all of them into the settings, and uh, ask if you have a replication inside these settings, and if not, you get five. You can ask for a letter, and if you don't find letter, a little keyword into the settings pack, uh, you just get a star. So if I call replicate with just a letter Z, I got five Z. Uh, funny thing, the uh, optional value, if you don't find the keyword, can be a callable function, callable object, sorry, uh, that takes the um, keyword as a parameter, or oh, the settings, I don't remember, probably the keyword, and uh, you do something ex uh, special when you don't find the keyword. That's the uh, the way we we handle, for example, the fact that you may want to assert or you may want to throw uh, if uh, you don't find your keywords. So just pass a callable function that just do whatever you want. Uh, instead of forcing one or the other behavior onto the user of the keyword parameters. Or you can call another function that we try to, um, how to say that, um, do something else with the settings or, or what. Uh, yeah, we can also have this uh, keyword parameters concept so you don't pass random crap to the replicate function. Okay, And uh, you can actually match your params with uh, some kind of structured uh, list of uh, keywords. So if, you, if you're bad at typing like I am, uh, you, will take, you will take care of, um, I would say that, um, mistypes or wrong, wrongly passed parameters. So all of this is end of this way, and uh, we, we use that uh, in our constructors uh, so we can actually fetch whatever information you want. Uh, it's actually okay for us because it's, uh, it's a very simple way to isolate the user, the base user from the power user because they just don't have to know about the keywords and they, will, they don't face a huge wall of uh, a myriad of different overloads for the constructor or whatever, all the functions. Um, we can actually never break the API because we take the keywords and uh, if you want to add some or restrict some, we, we have a way to do that in a non-breaking way. And um, everything uh, at compile time is endorsed with that concept if, if cost expert and it's a very low cost at, at compile time. Um, so we can actually have something that is pretty close to uh, what I think is uh, good enough keywords parameter feature sets. Uh, the library is like 200 lines, something like this, very, uh, very um, small, actually. And uh, we can actually do a bunch of things with that. Um, so that's what we wanted to get uh, on, on board on this, is uh, we, we use this kind of keyword parameters to, to pass API in a way that actually makes sense. So we have a bunch of questions on these parts. Uh, oh, a bench bench, actually. Uh, so can I, can't we just write a shape keyword of something, something? Um, well, we, we thought about that. Uh, and the, um, the way we can do this actually uh, it's uh, it's it's a bit en passant, like they say. Uh, let let me show back uh, to the to the actual uh, things. Uh, actually, uh, well, I didn't I didn't go into this point of details, but uh, you can uh, you can actually uh, link uh, a keyword to a bunch of types, and whenever you have a value of these types. It is considered by Rabiru to be actually as if you wrote shape equals something like keyword equals your value of these types. So the off shape things return a type, uh, which is actually tagged to be uh, associated with the shape keywords. And so basically, what we do on mean for is exactly equivalent to actually passing uh, shape keyword equal something something. But uh, if you do that, uh, we have another limitation: is that you cannot uh, you cannot add more than uh, 
one non keyworded types uh, into the constructors. So you could actually write allocator equal something uh, comma uh, of shape 2020 directly. Uh, but we find out it's more clear to just, you know, like um, just list all of them. But we, we have this uh, flexibility on the fact that we can forgot some keywords when there is no uh, ambiguity on the fact that a shape is a shape, it, it won't be an allocator or or whatnot. So actually, uh, you can consider line four as an example of what you say. Actually. And the code gen for, uh, <laughs> a good question. Uh, I never checked actually more, more than that, what the code gen is for the operator brackets, but considering is a bunch of if const expert, uh, that call a single function uh, in, a, in a class that contains multiple overload of, a fun of, of different functions, uh, you probably end up with something which is correct. Uh, we can have a look at that later if you want. Uh, but I'm, I'm not very, uh, I'll say that. I'm, I'm not very uh, scared about that. Uh, is keyword type erased? Uh, nope, it is not. It's not. It's a good old type. And um, what happens if I pass repetition equal some uh, stuff? Uh, well, you will have um, probably a consca pointer inside the keyword. Yeah. Apparently, probably. Uh, yeah, it, it will decay when it's when it's showing to the. Uh, yeah, you you will get the const pointer to the uh, to the literal string. So I, I think we have that at some point. So we, I know it works. I know it was. Uh, but yeah, keywords are not type erased because we, we usually consume them whenever we just use them. So uh, they are not uh, something we want to store or to uh, uh, manage in, an, in another way than by actually managing them by, uh, by a template parameters. And uh, can you have a keyword and fix non-keyword overload? Uh, not sure I understand the question. I may be a bit. Uh, can you elaborate, Matthew? Is it on the chat or in the question? Oh, do, do you mean uh, like, oh, maybe I understand that's right. Can we have that, for example, like, like an overload with, uh... oh, okay. Uh, with with a one with a match and one one without a match or something like that, is it what you mean, Matthew? Because if, if if it is, yes, you can actually. And uh, this is based on requires, so we probably just uh, take the correct pass, uh, depending on what you what you uh, what you pass to the function. We we have to test that actually. Yeah. Uh, don't, but, uh, it should work. I mean, it, it's 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 in, in it's in a require clause for something. Uh, I have also, uh, thank you. I also a remark in the chat, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, there was a talk yesterday that discourages to use structures as one liner. Uh, I guess we have to watch the, all the lightning talks then. Uh, I would appreciate if you have the name of the, of the presenter so I can have a look at that. I'm very uh, interested into this. Um, and uh, yeah, we will get to look at that. Okay, thank you. So, well. Um, last part now is uh, basically uh, we got this. Oh, come on. Okay. We got these keyword things. We got these opaque types that let us just doesn't care about uh, whatever we do in the, uh, in the template things. Uh, but there is other places where we wanted to go a bit further. Yeah. And that brings us to a generic non type template parameters, which is a big new thing in C20. So, we used to have non-type template parameters, uh, which were very restricted to mostly integral type, um, like for like in array, for example. It was also possible, but they were not really used a lot uh, with animation type, pointer types, and L-value reference type. Um, so in, instead of int, in, in array, we can also have all, all these uh, different uh, kind of entities. And that was before C20. But now in C20, we have two new things. 
it's possible to have floating floating point types and uh, literal class types with some restrictions. And in what will follow, uh, what we in, in what follows, we will focus on literal class types because with that we can actually do a lot. And this is really a game changer for how the way and for how we design interfaces. So the thing is that um, with this new feature, uh, if we use these generic NTTPs, uh, and by generic NTTP, uh, I mean being able to use arbitrary class types with some, with some restrictions as template parameters, um, plus expression template, which is the thing we can use to do a lazy evaluation, then the template syntax um, becomes, and, and the, the place where we can put template parameters become EDSL mini compilers. So EDSL stands for Embedded Domain Specific Language. And what that means is that in template, uh, in template now, we have a whole system that acts like a mini compiler for specific language. And uh, uh, what that does is that it's, um, by doing that, we can capture arbitrary context per expression as non-type template parameters. And with that, that also allows us to, to uh, manipulate code, to generate code, to, to do a lot in, um, in template parameters. So what we wanted to do and what we wanted to experiment is how can we use this new mechanism to solve a very like an old problem, which is how can we define uh, array shapes? Like how we can have a mini language to specify the shape of multidimensional arrays. So what we want to do is also to be able to support runtime and compile time and hybrid shapes. For example, if you have if you have an array with uh, the first and second dimension that you know, and the last two ones that you don't know at compile time and that will uh, be decided at runtime. So we want to be able to do that. And we want to be able to do that with a single type, a single interface, uh, and something that runs as fast as possible. And with these new features, with this new feature, uh, it's open new ways of, of doing that. So the problem, if we if we look more into the problem we are we are interested in, so what we mean by error shape is the the dimensions of the array, the rank of the array, meaning the the, the number of, of dimensions we have, uh, and also which ones are dynamic, which ones are static, et cetera, et cetera. So um, multidimensional multidimensional arrays. Um, for sciences and for a lot of applications, they gather data in a n-dimensional grid. So in most cases, um, a lot of scientific codes use one-dimensional grids and, and two-dimensional grids, but some can, can, can go further. And for example, in machine learning, there is a lot of things that are called tensor, even though they don't fit the mathematical definition of what a tensor is. But what they mean by that is an n-dimensional array. So the number in the problem we are in, interested in is that the rank of this grid is known at compile time. The, the number of dimension is known at compile time. However, the number of elements along each dimension may vary. Uh, some may be known at compile time, some may be known at, at runtime. Um, in typical use cases, we will have uh, either very small array, um, but a lot of them with static dimensions, or very large matrices uh, that will be uh, whose dimension will be known at at runtime instead of compile time. And we wanted to 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 solve both of these use cases with the same interface. Um, and the Last thing is that the initial ordering of, of those different um, size can be domain specific and can be arbitrary. So as I said before, we can have alternatively static and dynamic dimension um, with uh, 
um, high order ranks and stuff like this. So one of the most basic example is just a four by three array. And we want a library to deal with something like this, but that can go far more complicated. So currently, uh, the way it's it's solved, uh, the way the problem is approached, for example, by uh, MD span, which is the current proposal in C++, um, faces it faces a difficult situation because um, so one problem. So there are several problems. One of the problem is that. Um, we have this specifier, which is dynamic extent, um, which makes it very verbose uh, to describe the shape of an array. And these dynamic extent cor correspond to minus one, which is non-type safe if, if we type it like that. So either it's verbose or it's non-type safe. So that's the first problem. Um, the second problem is that uh, we want to have a single interface um, in our case, we want to have a single interface to deal um, with uh, compile time and runtime shapes and be able to, to define these shapes and to, and to pass them to, um, to multidimensional arrays and to have everything handled well. So um, to solve this problem with um, NTDPs, instead of having these... Um, er this case where everything is an integer, we want to have something far more rich and far more expressive than that. And we want to have something that is at the same time high performance, generic, and expressive. So by high performance, we mean that through NTDPs, it will be possible to do uh, abstract syntax tree manipulation so that the compiler can optimize as much as possible uh, with the information provided by the user at compile time. By generic, we mean that we want unified interfaces so that uh, when users um, manipulate things that um, that doesn't do not necessarily implement in, uh, translate in the same um, compiled code, but that but that correspond to the same concept, we want to offer the, the same interface for that. And by expressive, we mean that we want something at the same time that is very terse, but also very precise, so that users can really describe easily what they want to, to do um, for, for their arrays. So as always, um, we start by defining what we would like users to be able to type. So the, and it's illustrated in, in, in the code below. So we want something, as I said, very terse, where, for example, uh, on, line th on line one, the user defines um, an array X that is a dynamic array, uh, a 3D dynamic array. Or we want the user to also be able to, 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 specify, um, to specify a 2D array with an original sizing of, of four by six. We also want the same way of specifying the, the shape for arrays that own their data, but also for views that just are that are just looking to data that can be uh, held uh, as well, elsewhere. And we want to do all of that with the same interface. So we start by designing something called an extend type that uh, will will care will care only about uh, runtime size storage. And we want to, to, to make it usable as a non-type template parameter so that uh, we have this unique interface to specify at the same time the, the dimensions that are fixed and the dimensions that are dynamic. So the, be the benefit of, the, of this approach is that we have, as I said, a unique type for static and dynamic extents. And uh, by feeding that into NTTP, we can make the size of array and the size of view minimal, meaning that when we have something, we, when we have an array where everything is defined at compile time, we can minimize the, the, the size of the array and do not um, get any overhead uh, due to the, to the interface we, we design. 
Uh, same thing for view. When everything when everything is not at compile time, we want view basically to decay to a pointer, or to be the same size as of a pointer. And to avoid the problem of using tags like minus one in the interface, um, by using NTTPs, we can we can have typed things into uh, into the template context, which makes it far easier to detect errors and to and to, to avoid problems. So <clears throat> to do that, uh, to be able to do that and, and to create the interface uh, with the extent I showed on, on the previous uh, slide. So in this uh, online, on uh, for example, online five, um, what that means is that the, so everything that, um, that use the subscript operator is a static dimension. We mean that the first dimension here is uh, the number of elements along the first axis is not at compile time, it's four. Then the parentheses mean that it will be decided at, at runtime, and the last one in, in bracket, in uh, using the subscript operator, is also known at, um, at compile time. Which makes it very easy to, to, to define arrays with alternating um, compile time and runtime dimensions. So to, to be able to do that, the first thing we, we do is we define a shaper that will um, hold the information of what the user type using and, and have something that is a lazy evaluation, uh, something that is um, like an expression template, so that we capture the sequence of operators used by the by the user. So the we define a shaper, which and the important thing to notice is that on line uh, nine and ten, we have these two operators that return a shaper with everything that has been processed so far plus either a new dynamic size or a static size. And, um, and by doing that, we are able to capture what the user is providing, providing at compile time. Using that, then we, we can uh, define helpers to help users um, express things in a very terse way. For example, a 3D array, a 3D dynamic array, then just... Uh, become underscore 3D that is equal to extent with three parentheses. Um, and we can define a more general operator, uh, which is underscore ND, that will be uh, able to, def that will add the required number of, pattern, of parentheses on extent. And we can do the same for uh, for static, for static syntax, etc. Et and this simplifies the thing from the user standpoint, but from the compiler standpoint, everything boils down to this uh, extent thing. Then the challenge we have is that um, we, for a given rank, we only want to have to store the runtime dimension. We don't want to store everything that is known at, at uh, compile time. For example, if you have an array of three by two by um, a dynamic dimension, we only want to have to store the dynamic dim the dynamic dimension part and not have to pay extra for the storage of, of three and two. And this is a real challenge to to do that. Um, to do that, it, it's not so easy. So the um, the way we want to, to deal with that is that we have the, the structure shape that takes the previous shaper as an input. And um, this shape um, gathers the information given by the shaper and, and, try, and determines whether it's the, the array is free dynamic, whether it's free static, whether um, it's, partially, uh, it's partially dynamic on, or, and, and whatnot. And so to minimize the size of the shape, uh, as I said before, we only want to, to store the dynamic dimensions. So to be able to do that, um, so 
So to be able to do that, uh, we have this compile time bitmap. Um, that, uh, and the way it will work is that we have this get function uh, on line 14. Um, and this get function, when the, um, when the thing is known at compile time, then it will just return the value, um, uh, the integral constant, uh, the integral constant corresponding to the value known at compile time. But when it's known at runtime, then we will have this uh, index thing that will, that will convert the compile time index. For example, let's say the third dimension uh, is dynamic, but the first two are static. Then this index list will make the translation of this third index correspond to the first thing that is stored dynamically. So when the storage is all dimensions that are known only at at, uh, at runtime then have their index becomes translated to a different compile time index so that we can access the right thing at uh, in the dynamic storage. And by doing so, we minimize the size of the data structures we have. So once we have that, um, we have this, um, so we have these, things, um, these different helpers. And from that, we can we, we define what we call a view builder. And, and what the view builder will do is that it will take, using the, the keyword thing described in the previous step, it will build the, the shape we want and the stride we want and all, the, all other possible options we want. They will be processed by view builder that will provide to um, the actual type um, what what the actual storage and what the actual um, way of accessing dimensions how it will work under the hood. So the view builder and and then we have the view or the array deriving from uh, this view builder that process the different settings provided by the user and provided by the by the syntax um, defined by the shapes and, and, and everything. So for example, um, view access, uh, in the view access case, um, we can then um, specialize it depending on, on whether we have a shape that is fully static or that is partially static or that is fully dynamic. And depending on that, the storage will be different. For example, in the, in the case that is fully static, we don't pay the price of extra storage. But in the case where we have something that is, um, that has, um, what's so it's, it's not fully static, apparently. It's not fully static. <laughs> so in the case where it's not fully static, then we have to say, we have to store the extra information uh, in, the, in, in the shape. And by doing it that way, we have a unique interface to, to store the thing, to minimize the size um, of the multidimensional array. So by doing all of that, then the question is whether, how do these things perform in, uh, in the real situation? And we can compare what happens with the, um, with the library we provide compared to uh, a row uh, array, a row pointer in, in C++, uh, in, even in C. And, and compare what is the assembly generated for these two things. And the good thing is that, so if, if you look at the, at the row C code, um, the good thing that it's auto-vectorized and there is direct access to the data and no excess bloat. Uh, I mean, it's C. It's C, yeah. it's row C, it's so. It's probably up to do that. But you see. Yeah, you never know. You never the know. the you compiler never know. is smart. It's, it's yeah. auto-vectorizing yeah, at it's, least. Oh, and now the subtle part. <laughs> and <laughs> in our case, we obtain exactly the same thing. Uh, only, the, only the name change because the, the size information is, is carried to the mangling and we, have, and we, rec we can retrieve all the information. But we obtain exactly the same thing. The, the code is auto-vectorized except that the interface is way nicer and way more generic. 
maybe we can take one one minute because we have okay, a yeah. bunch of time sure. to uh okay no so now it's it's live demo mode so it probably just doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> uh are we are we still okay um yeah it's supposed to be compiler explorer right now is it yeah it should be uh, maybe not wait yeah the the answer was no of course so it should be now it is okay right so uh that that's the basic uh things that we had just before let's Let's ramp up the, the font size. Um, so that's that's the three old cases actually because we we know everything, so yeah. we know everything, so everybody knows everything. Uh, so cool thing is that what happens if we have mixed, you know, um, compile time and, and, and runtime run time things. So basically, in C, that means that we probably need something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, wait, how, how should we do that? Oh, let, let's let's be you know like very uh, no. Let, let let's be you know like let's be nice with the C with the C side. So we just have sixteen times n to process, okay? And uh, yeah, it, it just do whatever it does, okay? It just just do some loops over that because it it knows it's some amount of sixteen times n. Uh, so what about what we do this? Uh, no, so yeah, let's we, we add that. Okay, so let's let's have a look again at the at the C code. Okay, and uh, that's what we got. So well, it's actually funny because we have a, we have a loop there. Okay, uh, exactly like the C code, and then we have uh, some leftover things uh, on the sides, which is basically looking. Uh, a bit different than this one, for whatever reasons, but we still have this uh, vectorized part. Um, another funny thing is that let, let's keep this one thing and uh, let's do something non, uh, not really uh, very smart, but let's say we uh, we do whatever, like uh, we, we have a two-dimensional array, so let's you know move on uh, this way. So that's a, normally the point where I I'm I'm botched that up, but you will just you tell me if I write wrap okay. So this and uh, in our cases we want to do the same thing. So uh, we could actually uh, do a double for loop, uh, but something we didn't oh come on something we didn't talk about uh, actually. Uh, what's the name for that? It's probably this. Because when you say containers, you know, you know they are not they are not that far away. <laughs> uh, we got some kind of algorithm on it. Um, so what we can actually do? Uh, so our our algorithm are a bit different uh, from the standard one. Um, in the way that they does not iterate on a bunch of containers, they iterate on uh, what should be at some point called an iteration space, but currently. You you pass the shape of of the of the whatever, and then you have to have a, a lambda there. It takes a y zero and the i one as a indexes because you have multiple dimensions, so you well you need to work them somehow. And uh, so this is going down. This is going up. And uh, let's do this. And uh, so it's probably something like this. So the uh, one of the benefit of the uh, okay does it compile actually before I, I'm I'm starting doing this. So I'm I'm working on double or on v uh, using the full shape of v. So I, I will be recursively running the loop on that and uh, one two three four. Oh, what does it do? Oh, it does a funny thing actually. Oh, that's GCC. Okay, so GCC knows that's something which is a pack of sixteen things. So it basically unroll everything and and puts a loop on top of that. It's not very smart. Well, it's okay, but it's not very smart. But let's see what. Uh, where is our? Okay, I I will take some precaution. Right? Let's <laughs> let's use trunk. Uh, yeah, Clang was not able to compile our. Uh, 
black magic with uh, NTTPs until recently. So, and bam, we are back to the uh, vectorized things. And uh, it's probably, yeah, it's one, two, three, four. Uh, four times four equals 16. So uh, it unrolls in your loop by doing 16 things in the vectorized way and you just loop over, which is exactly what you what we want. And the cool thing is that I can actually change that to a different uh, shape, like this, for example. It doesn't have to touch the thing. And uh, I don't know what it will be doing, actually. What, what does it do there? Uh, a lot of crap, apparently. <laughs> no, it's still vectorized. Oh, uh, yeah. By pieces, apparently, but it yeah. works. And then you have the trading thing. So it, it just adapts itself. Um, so that's, that's the cool part. One other cool thing is that, um, yeah, if if we go back to that, for example, it won't it won't work. But uh, let's do nothing inside. That's that's a cool thing to do. You know, we don't do anything. Um, I mean, it, it's basically nothing. Like we can pass those a static view by value, and and it's basically passing a pointer. Uh, the size of these things is like size of void star. And as long as we keep adding uh, static size, yes, static yeah. size, it, it's still size of void star. I mean, it never changed. So those view, uh, static view over whatever, just cause the same as a pointer. So you can just pass them like, like there is no tomorrow and, um, and, uh, and it's done. Um, it's a bit different for the array things because the array uh, carry dimensions, but uh, basically what's going on there, it's probably, okay, it's not happy because I didn't include array, of course. I, I knew I would watch that at some point. But yeah, I mean, we don't do anything, doesn't do anything. Um, those things, uh, when you have a static array, just, just store that into the uh, stack-based storage and so on and so forth. So. Um, it's made so this behavior um, for um, how to say that um, for all those static size based objects uh, just behave like like they should. We pay a bit extra in some cases, especially in the cases of dynamically large dimension array, because at some point we need to store the stride and so on. But the, the cool thing is that the size increase is completely. Uh, I mean, it's known in advance. And it's um, it's grow uh, sublinearly with the number of dimensions. So uh, you really have to have like stupidly large number of dimensions to have something that is which is too big for the compiler to uh, to uh, handle properly, uh, at least at this level. But so the cool thing is that uh, views cost basically nothing, and when they start costing something, they cost a minimal amount of what we do. And so the compiler is able to to see through all of this. Uh, including the uh, the collection of the shapes, the collection of all the um, the, the dimension opening things. So that's actually uh, the cool thing. So if we go back to the slides, because well, that's where are the slides? Uh, <laughs> yeah, is it is it this one? Okay. Did I did I just lost the slides? Yeah, I did. I did lose the slide. Okay. Not a problem. It's coming back. Back online. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Should be back. So we, we, we have this um we have this actually level of control. And uh, the, the thing we saw into the uh, view access things uh is basically done uh, for various scenarios, and we, we try every time to compress the uh, the impact of that and on the size. And, and it also it allows users to, if they want to add hardcore specialization and hardcore optimization, yeah, they, can they, do, can they, they can do it themselves. They can do it themselves. Uh, it's just you, that we you, provide you can, some. You can use that as, a, yeah, as an extension. Point. Yeah, as a customization point. Yeah. Um, so there is a question. Maybe we can, oh, is it done? Uh, is it done? Oh, it's done. No, no it's, uh, I, I will do the confusion and then I will answer the question. <laughs> So the thing is that, as, as we saw in C++ 20, it's really a game changer. And, and this approach with um, generic NTTP uh, open new possibilities in terms of design and new ways of, de of designing APIs and way uh, to provide far more generic interfaces with these mi-language 
that you can embed into uh, into the template parameters. And uh, and by doing so and combining um, NTGPs and um, and um, uh, expression template, we can forward a lot of domain specific information um, and to the compiler so that it can it can have uh, it can make high level of optimization. So the approach we took a multidimensional array shapes was a non-incremental approach, meaning that we we look at what was done before, but we, we try to restart from scratch and say, how can we do it better with uh, the new thing that are available in C20? Uh, we have a unified static and dynamic array abstraction um, that is at the same time terse, rich, and natural. Natural meaning that for for People who are working in the field uh, of multidimensional arrays and manipulate a lot of multidimensional arrays, it's easy to write. Um, and as we saw uh, in Compiler Explorer, it provides high level of optimization for, for multidimensional arrays. And one thing to, to one highlight of, of this part is that uh, is really to consider um, generic the combination of generic NTTPs and expression templates as EDSL compilers, compilers to process mini language uh, in, in, in template as, param as template parameters. So now I can answer the question. <laughs> um, so so can you specify? Yeah. Um, OK. So can you specify implied al alignment for views? You mean uh, stride, I guess. You mean stride, or you mean uh, memory alignment? Uh, because both, is, because both, both are, are, are both are possible. Memory alignment, yeah. Uh, that's probably going to be an align allocator somehow. Or uh, we can actually have. Uh, uh, oh, we can actually have an alignment. Uh, we can. Pass oh yeah, yeah. View, you know, view have no allocation. Yeah, of course. No, but yeah, you can, no, no. View have no allocation, so we can have an alignment uh, parameters. That's okay. Yeah, yes. you can pass that as the. Yeah, as alignment the, equal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can have that. Yeah, sorry. As I'm, a keyword. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we have no. Allocation. But for arrays. Yeah, for arrays, arrays. We, can <laughs> we can have both. We can do both. No, yeah, we we could actually add uh, add uh, an alignment things on, on top of that. Uh, if it's called Sexper in the part, in the template, we can actually possibly pass it down to uh, adding, uh, you know, the built-in uh, aligned, assume aligned things mm -hmm. directly on the pointer. Sh should be doable. I, I see no technical uh, issue with doing this. So, yeah, we can do that. I, I see where you're going with this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, other question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 will probably do that. Um, I, I, we have to make an issue. We need we need we need actually to do this. Yes, indeed. indeed. Most of the time, uh, that's exactly an, a, a good you know example of this power user things. Um, I mean that most people don't care about that, but when, when you care about it, uh, you you need to have a way to do that. And now, I mean, we can just add the keywords, uh, do the things, and and we get the information. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that's perfectly doable. Yep. Any other questions? Apparently, we have some more time, so. That's for now, I guess. Okay. So, which brings us to the conclusion. To the actual, <laughs> to the actual <laughs> final conclusion. Did you get away? Oh, yeah. Okay, is it? Okay. Yeah, it's working. So, let's conclude. Let's conclude. <laughs> <laughs> So as I said before, C plus twenty twenty is really a game changer for people who are doing a lot of uh, compile time optimization and and template meta programming. Uh, these uh, NTTP, these generic NTTP things um, are really a thing. Plus, combined with the the keyword and the opaque types, we can we can really uh, do a lot, and we really have the tools to have a better structured template code and to avoid. I mean, for years, um, we have been trying to avoid to have spaghetti code, but in some way, some template code is still type unsafe. Now we have the way to make it structured and, and type safe. Let's say template code is like you name, fetch code. <laughs>
Um, and, uh, and the thing is that if you want to be able to exploit that, uh, since the, the syntax is different and since the approach is different, uh, we can just go there by just uh, incrementally uh, improving things that already exist. We can, we can uh, look at what people were trying to do before and, and try to provide this, this new way of, of looking at things. Um, as we saw, breaking the old patterns was very fruitful. Um, we, the, the approach that was uh, very uh, useful for us was to start by thinking about what we would like to type, what the user would like to type, to type and from there to derive, um, how, to derive a possible implementation and then try to converge on something that is uh, easy to type but also implementable. And uh, when everything is done at, at compile time, uh, as always, <laughs> there is no noticeable drop in performance. We should do everything at compile time. <laughs> we should have a, a compile time supercomputer. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah. We, yeah, we should yeah. make a proposal about this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the libraries we, uh, we described in the, in the talk are available. So Raberu um, is available as... Uh, OFW thing, the so it's currently uh, kind of stable and and you can start uh, using it. It, it works and pe other people that use it didn't explode yet. So, okay, uh, <laughs> yet <laughs> should be should be good for Kiyoku though. It's more experimental at yeah. this point, and yeah. uh, you can try to exp to explode it. <laughs> you probably explode it at, at the moment, uh, but you can start playing it with it and maybe be inspired by the by the approach and try to extend it. Try to find new ways of using NTTPs and and exploit the extend syntax with this bracket thing yeah. and parentheses thing uh, that solves all problems. Um, for the years to come. Something we are very interested in is the can genericity in template. And by that, we mean that currently uh, template parameters are either types or values uh, or template templates. But uh, people in the startup committee are currently looking at providing a unification and abstraction of all of that uh, so that you can have the same, you can have. A template parameter that could be either type, a value, a template template, a template template template, a template template, et cetera, et cetera and all the hierarchy uh, at the same time. And with that, it will bring us, it will bring a, really a new step in, instead of genericity and in terms of what we can do to create mini language that can uh, that can be processed at compile time. The other thing is that maybe uh, there is this circle thing um, in um, that is uh, studied also. Uh, I've been is being studied in in the South committee um, to uh, which are currently extension of the compiler uh, embedded in in the new compiler and maybe with some of the approaches that are used by Circle uh, we could uh, we could do what we are currently doing in a mo much more simple way, and also maybe a much more expressive way. And I think that's it, except that's, if that's, you have something to add. No. OK. Uh, well, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe well, I'll maybe expand on such a thing. Uh, it's, yeah, can we actually use reflection to, so we can actually, you know, like massage or yeah. do like in a, in a way? Uh, because usually we, we we do the thing so that it's easy for the user and we suffer actually. So maybe it should be cool <laughs> if we stop suffering at some point. So uh, yeah, we, we are eyeballing those things. Uh, just to say that. So um, well, well, I think you, it's a wrap. Thanks uh, for, thanks for your attention. If you have any other questions, yeah. it would be a pleasure to uh, answer them. And uh, please uh, think about filling your feedback survey uh, whenever you have time about this track. And uh, I will be probably we will probably be there a bit more into the, the Discord chat if you have another, any other question or uh, want to discuss something in details. Uh, so thanks again uh, for your attention. Uh, I hope you, you enjoyed this talk. Yeah. And uh, probably next time, <laughs> have a great, have a great uh, day at the end of the conference. Enjoy your, uh, your keynotes and uh, see you soon. Bye. Bye.